our, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Arts Access Services, but I really want to talk with you today about a journey that we've been on over the last four years, um, which has really opened our eyes to new ways of working, and as a result, uh, uh, it's an invitation that we extend to all of our partners and to you today to really open your eyes to the opportunities of working with uh, people with a disability. So um, Arts Access Victoria is the state's leading organisation in arts and disability. We're at the Victorian peak body. And um, we have a 40 year history and, you know, like Arts Project Australia, our wonderful colleagues um, and Footscray Community Arts Centre, something really exciting must have been happening in the arts in the 1970s that um, really, you know, hasn't, hasn't had a resurgence and, and that focus on the importance of community arts in that, in that really concentrated way. And, and that's a little bit of our story as well. So, so um, I'm not going to tell you a 40-year story because uh, we'll be here all afternoon. I'm going to tell you the last little while of our story. So, so four years ago, um, uh, the Victorian government decided to commission some research into arts and disability to see what was the state of participation in Victoria for people with a disability in arts and culture. And what they discovered in that research, which has been documented in a, in a very good um, uh, consultation and uh, literature review called Picture This, if anyone's interested, it's on the Arts Victoria website. What was documented there was a, a pretty grim picture of very low levels of participation, so the lowest levels of participation of any group in the community. And... Um, that's for audiences with a disability and also artists and arts workers. Now, what was very confronting, I think, for my organisation during that was a lot of the criticism was directed at Arts Access Victoria. And uh, uh, many of our stakeholders felt that the organisation had really done well during that period of time since its establishment had... Um, developed you know, mul mul multiple sources of funding, was recognised at, at a federal level and also as a state level as a leading producer of, of art, um, but that in general, uh, the community that we were servicing felt impoverished and they felt that um, opportunities for artists working outside of the, uh, of the context of Arts Access Victoria were very, very thin on the ground. And so it really was a tremendous challenge for the organisation to hear that kind of feedback. And, 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 uh, um, and to its credit, the organisation responded, I think, in a very dramatic way by really opening its eyes to those sorts of scenarios and understanding that in order to be successful, we couldn't just focus on our business. We couldn't just focus on our organisation. We absolutely had to focus on what was happening outside. So, in a sense, your business became our business. And that's what we've been doing over the last four years. So, we've developed... So, so we still have a significant part of our business, which is what we call our producing arm. And we produce more than 25 projects each year which showcase the best that artists with a disability can produce. And we do that across all art forms. We have a number of studio spaces that we work in and we have significant visual arts programs, but also literature, dance, theatre, and the list goes on. But in addition to that, what we've also produced is a really significant industry development program. And some of you may have been involved with that, with that part of our, our organisation. So uh, this year alone, we've just completed um, training for 100 arts organisations in disability action planning. Um, which assists those organisations to really ask that question about how do I effectively engage with people with a disability as audiences, as artists and as arts workers. Um, we have over 150 partnerships now with arts organisations looking at their programming. So I think that um, uh, if we had a chance now to revisit uh, with our critics for, from from. Uh, four years ago, I think what they would say and what they do say to us is that we've really created an opportunity to open up many new um, avenues for artists with a disability and for audiences. Um, but in, in you know at, at, a, at an absolute principles level, we 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 are committed to making sure that whatever we ask of you we do ourselves. So whatever we ask of arts organisations that we absolutely do ourselves. And so I just want to take you through that story a little bit. 
So some of these stats you will know. Um, nearly four million Australians, one in five, report having a disability. And obviously, as you age, you are more likely to acquire a disability with those who are 70 and over, 70% 70 of those 70 and over having a disability. What you may not know is that 45% of Australians with a disability live below or near the poverty line, more than double the OECD average of 22%. What this means, I think, what this has mean has meant, is that people with a disability have had limited capacity to engage with your type, your organisations as consumers, if you like, where there is a requirement that they have to pay for their participation. Now, many of you are public galleries, and that's not the case. But this has been a, a significant reason why participation rates are so low. However, we are in the midst of one of the most significant reforms really in a generation in Australia, and that is the NDIS. If the federal government commits, it delivers on its commitments to NDIS, we'll see another $6 billion um, come into the disability sector. And unlike in the past, that money is not going in the hands of organisations. It's going into the hands of people with a disability to be able to actually do the things that we um, do, who, those of us who are fortunate to be in paid employment. And can I tell you that the statistics for employment of people with a disability are equal dismal, uh, they will have money to actually pay for their participation. And this is something that I think means that arts organisations across the board need to sit up and take notice that they, they are going to be a very significant audience uh, group into the future. In terms of cultural participation, I've mentioned that um, the statistics are still pretty pretty low. Um, the uh, ABS statistics show that, well, according to them, 25% of people with a disability attended theatres or concerts, compared with 38% of all Australian adults. Um, and 20% visited museums or art galleries, compared to 38% of um, all Australians. I actually think that the museum and gallery sector is doing quite well. I think that if you took cinemas out of these statistics, you would find that the reverse is the case, that actually your, your sector is, is doing much more to engage people with a disability than um, perhaps other sectors. Um, and I think that's what skews that result. But still, it, it is low, and, um, it, and thus this kind of forum is absolutely critical to really explore what are the barriers and how, how do you actually address them? I have a read of this. This is, this, is a com this is where our conversations usually start. So whenever we are entering, entering into a new relationship with an arts organisation, we have some version of this conversation. This actually isn't a cartoon. I made that up. That was a true conversation that I had with someone. And it blows me away because, obviously, um, the issues of accessibility are fraught. And we generally start talking about accessibility around infrastructure, so physical access. And it's something that we've worked really hard to shift with our partner organisations. So, you know, you, most of us, and, and, and to be honest with you, look, Arts Access is, is in an inaccessible building, so it's a very real conversation for us. We don't have stairs, but we are, you know, we do have a, a we, we're in a building that was built in the 1970s. It complied with the code in the 1970s. It doesn't now. It's got a ramp that has a, um, a gradient that is, is not appropriate, and, and it's good for us to be in that building because it absolutely challenge us, challenges us to understand that, um, Access has to be about more than just our physical environment. And, you know, our ramp is on our strategic plan. Our ramp is absolutely something that we need to address and we're constantly reporting on. But there is so much more that we can do to be accessible than just have this conversation about physical access. And some of you will be similarly... Um, you know, in, in buildings that are inaccessible or, or have access challenges. But if that's the only conversation that you're having, it's a very limiting one. And particularly, I, I'll dare say that most people in the room don't really have control over capital budgets. And so whilst 
we've got to keep working on those sorts of things. There are many other things that we can be doing. And this is the kind of thing that we talk about all the time. This is where we start and, and I think it's a really empowering um, point and that is um, that, you know, like other social movements, uh, women's, the women's movement, uh, inclusion for and recognition of the, um, Indigenous Australians, for example, that changing attitudes is something that we can all do and it costs us nothing. And, and that is a great point, a, a great conversation starter in terms of how we create change. So a lot of our work is around around this. This, is, this statement here is absolutely what drives us in everything that we do. This uh, was, is a quote out of Shut Out. Shut Out was a seminal report that was produced by the National Disability and Carers Council that really led to the NDIS. It led to the Productivity Commission establishing the inquiry into that then resulted into the NDIS. And it talks about, and I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to have a read of that. So, so for us, what drives us as an organisation is the recognition that we have the capacity to change this. That, that not only in our own, in our own work and in our own, within our own community, but that through the arts, we have the capacity to change this for people with a disability and with people with a disability. And so we've set ourselves a big agenda. We don't call ourselves an arts organisation or a disability organisation. We're an agent for social change and that's what we're here to do. And we use the arts as an instrument for that. And we don't apologise for it. Now, having, having done that, um, we've had just enormous support. Um, we've doubled in size, so we, get fund we, we are funded from all three tiers of government and across a range of different government areas because we're very clear about our mission. Um, we have um, 70 staff and we deliver around about 100 initiatives a year. So our capacity to actually do some of this this work has, has doubled as a result of really moving away from what we found to be quite limited frameworks and limited sort of definitions. We've, we've gone the whole hog and said that we're here absolutely to change the lives that people with a disability are living. And as a result, we're having new conversations with Department of Health, Department of Human Services, Department of Justice, Department of um, um, Office for Youth, for example. And they're it, that's a very exciting playing field for us because our practice hasn't changed in terms of the arts. We've only been we've been able to really invest in the depth of that practice, but we're just engaging a whole range of new new partners. And as I mentioned, um, our, our collaborative approach with arts organisations means that we're, we're even within the arts we've been able to attract new funding. So we've been able to get fun, um, funding through the Australia Council for for six years under the Key Producer category. And, uh, and in Victoria as a lead organisation. So I think it is liberating rather than constraining um, to actually set your mission as, as something, you know, quite um, ambitious uh, because it brings you into play with a whole range of, of different um, funders, stakeholders and partners. The other thing that, that drives us is, is um, moving beyond the social model. So um, for those of you who, who, who don't know, in Australia has been quite, um, for, I suppose for the last 30 years, the advocacy movement in Australia has really been pushing this notion that um, a social model drives disability. So rather than, I, you know, I may not be disabled were it not for the environment that I operate in. So if I didn't have to contend with the flight of stairs, if I didn't have to contend with programs that don't provide me with Auslan interpreters, then, um, uh, you know, I would be able to participate fully and without barriers. We we are keen on on absolutely keen on that model, but also moving beyond that model um, to to one that really recognises one that there's a business case for the inclusion of people with a disability. People with a disability have money to spend, and businesses who don't want to engage with them are cutting off their nose to spite their face because they they are paying customers. That there is um, a creative case that people with a disability have unique and untold stories to tell. 
And I think that's gold in the arts. I mean, I, you know, artists tripping over themselves to come up with the next original idea. And um, if you have any engagement with people with a disability, you absolutely know that, that it is just rich terrain. Their stories are compelling, um, universal. Uh, they, attra they attract new audiences by virtue of, of, of that originality and the fact that they've been silenced and invisible for far too long. So. Um, there, there's a, a whole creative case to be made and, and we're very keen on, on that notion. Fundamentally, we also believe that, um, like, like all of us, we want to see our stories represented on screen, on the stage, in our galleries. We want to see our experiences. When, when the arts community doesn't engage with people with a disability and when the stories that are told are stories that, that pertain to the mainstream or stories that are different from mine, that, be, that presents a barrier to engagement. So I think that um, you know, if you want to build diverse audiences and bring people with a disability into your organisations, programming is absolutely essential. And too many organisations are thinking about disability inclusion from only from an audience point of view. And I would really say to you, um, have a think about what you're doing around your programming and, and to what extent that's actually going to bring those, th those communities into, into your gallery spaces. There's also a growing movement in Australia around disability culture. Um, that, 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 that overwhelming um, philosophy around normalisation that's existed in this country has really had its day. And there's a sense that people with a disability own their identity in a really positive and constructive way. They enjoy the experiences that that brings for them. And, and we have to reflect that in our storytelling as well, in whatever medium we do it. And it is powerful. I mean, I heard an, an amazing um, arts project the other day that was done by an organisation that wouldn't even be known by any arts organisation called the Self-Advocacy Resource Unit. And they're an interesting organisation because they are the sister organisation to um, the um, Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. Now, everybody knows who the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre is, but nobody knows who SARU is. And uh, it, it, it's a... It's a fascinating parallel that um, as, as a community, we make decisions about the things that interest us, the things that we're going to be passionate about, the things, the causes that we're going to attach to. We make decisions about that. Um, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, uh, the asylum seeker refugee issue has attracted a lot of support, and, and rightly so. And, and yet I always think it's, it's fascinating that disability organisations like SARU don't have the same support and yet some of the work that they're doing has very strong parallels. I don't know, I don't really have an answer for why that is. I do, but I don't really want to share it with you today. You, you can have a think about it and perhaps talk, if it interests you, talk with some of your, your um, colleagues about it. But SARU is doing a project um, at the moment, which is about the representation of um, the stories of intellectually disabled women who've had their children forcibly taken from them by the, the um, uh, uh, care system. And, and these, are, these are absolutely fundamentally important stories to tell, and yet they're told in, in very marginalised and isolated contexts. So in the broader arts community, there isn't a sense that, or there isn't necessarily a vehicle for bringing those, those stories into the light, into, into our uh, places where, where other people are going to hear those stories. So unfortunately, in, in the instance of this project called Dangerous Deeds, these women um, are telling this, these stories to each other. And they're telling these stories to disability advocates who already know the stories and who already were there because we're already engaged. What are the pathways for these women's, women to tell these stories in, in, in other contexts in the mainstream? I think you are those pathways, but we haven't actually connected the dots. So that's what we're here to do. That's, that's really what our mission is, is to help connect those dots and create those relationships. Some of the ways that we've been doing this... So throughout, um, so as I mentioned, we have we have three different programs. So we have our arts program, which is about what we do as a producer. We have our access program, which is about our industry engagement and industry development. And then we have our pathways program. So we're supporting around about 40 artists with a disability across a range of art forms. And we do those through um, the Boost Mentoring Program, which is funded through the Australia Council. 
The Boost Mentoring Program enables artists, or enables us to really facilitate very unique relationships between artists um, with a disability and facilitating artists who may or may not be be people with a disability, but people who have an established practice, people who have a commitment to passing on some of that, that experience. And it's a very intense coaching model, so it operates over a longer period of time than your, most of your mentoring, mentoring programs. Um, in general, we would say that the vast majority of artists that we work with um, are still at the emerging phase. And the, the sad reality is that um, most artists with a disability, and probably um, Arts Project Australia is one of the few examples where this is not the case, but in, in the vast majority of cases, artists with a disability stay in that emerging space for a, a very long period of time, in many cases up to 10 years. And, and that is a result of the, the paucity of opportunities they have to really develop their practice in a way that re is responsive to, to their particular needs. So this program doesn't have a time limit. Um, those, uh, some of those artists have been involved in the mentoring program now for two years and they will continue to work in that mentoring program. They may or may not be working with the same mentor. This is an artist, Jocelyn Lee. I think Jocelyn's also in your, in your program, isn't she, Sue? So, so again, um, we're working with a, a, a very small group of artists and, and I think um, there is a huge demand to expand uh, this program. Um, but this, this particular uh, artist also had an opportunity to work um, through the JUMP mentor, mentoring program. So another thing that we do is we're constantly looking for opportunities to actually seek funding for artists to develop their work outside of the context of what we do but really looking at, at how, other, how accessible are other funding programs and, and how equitable are they in terms of the percentage of um, total funds that go to artists with a disability. So one of the things that we look at is wherever there is funds being used to support artistic practice, how, in, to what extent they reflect that diverse agenda. Okay. Um, and Andrew Follows is another artist. This is Andrew with his mentor, Marcus. Um, and again, we've been working with Andrew for three years now, and he's just had his first uh, solo exhibition in a commercial gallery. So it, these, these processes are, are very, you know, they're, they're, they last beyond the general um, uh, period of time that most programs do. What I, I might end with just... Um, this one here, and that is to say that we've, over the past four years, we've built a huge bank of resources around accessibility, and most of them are available on our website, and also we've done the ADAPT program for, um, uh, from, for Arts Victoria. There is nothing about inclusion of artists with a disability that you won't find there, so please use these resources. They will help you to look at not only um, the accessibility of your programs, but also how you might look at programming and, and including artists with a disability in, in, your, in the programming elements of what you do. Thanks. Sorry, so much to take in. There's Gary over there. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me at the back there with my deaf accent, but I just wanted to um, make more of a comment about what Veronica was talking about. <coughs> she was talking about only 20%, I think, of people with a disability attend art-related things, 38% of the normal population. You know that in the general population that's true. Less people with disability get into employment, less people with a disability get into recreation and so on. And when you're thinking about increasing inclusion, it's a good idea, and I want you to write this down, to think about the multiplier effect, because for every disabled person that goes out, 2.5 people will go with them. There will be family members, it will be friends, it will be carers or whatever. So by increasing inclusion, you increase your overall audience as well. So I think it's important to say that. Thank you. Thank you.